sorry, we're running a couple of minutes late. We had a construction project in the back. You guys do realize I'm still going to be looking at my watch, even though you put no, it no, on. no. Matt <laughs> said you would. Matt said you needed a clock. <laughs> <laughs> People are easily offended. I think. <laughs> no, it's just habit. I mean, I I want to make sure I give you guys a break in between, and that I'm sort of timing myself correctly. I'll try. We'll put an alarm on it. There you go. <laughs> Or we'll just act alarmed. <laughs> now, if you see everybody's head turn around and look at the clock, yeah. Well, if anybody else looks at that clock, it's coming down. <laughs> All right. Let's open with a word of prayer. Our Father God, we are truly grateful for your grace to us in allowing us together to study your word. And we pray that your Holy Spirit would teach us. Uh, you are the teacher and encourager. We ask that you would open our minds and hearts, direct us and protect us, guide us to a greater knowledge of the truth that you desire for us to know and that you have shared with us through your word. We pray that you would direct us that we may come to love Jesus more. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, welcome to our New Testament survey class. Today we're going to be talking about the Gospel of John and the Acts of the Apostles. Um, this may cut off a little bit at the top or bottom. I will be reading it to you. This will be available, obviously, online um, the, as soon as we can get that up. Uh, our class structure, last week, last week we talked about the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We're going to just uh, sort of restate very, very briefly about them again today because today we're going to be talking about the Gospel of John, the fourth Gospel, and also the Book of Acts. Um, in particular, again, as I say, cut off a little bit, the, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, as we discussed last week, are called the Synoptic Gospels. That means same seeing or seen together. It can be translated either way. The seen together part of it is if you laid out Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they are very similar. As we discussed last week, 97% um, of the book of Mark, pretty much, is, is contained in either Luke or in Matthew. And uh, so they're very similar. They tell much the same stories. There is there's some discrete uh, content in each of them, but uh, not a lot. They're very similar. They tell a historic kind of view of the life of Jesus with slightly different perspectives. Uh, Matthew is very Jewish. He is concerned about uh, sharing the truth of Jesus, the history of Jesus, with the Jewish people. Mark is um, probably writing to... to Christians in Rome and is much more Gentile in his approach in that he explains the Jewish um, words, he explains the Jewish ceremonies, that sort of thing. Luke, while he was a Gentile himself, a Gentile physician, and uh, the only Gentile writer of any part of the Bible, he is more universal. He's addressing issues that both Jewish Christians and Gentile, <coughs> Gentile Christians would probably relate to. Then we come to the Gospel of Mark. What this says, that you may not be able to read at the bottom, is that, or I'm sorry, John. John presents Jesus as the divine, eternal Son of God who came to earth in human form. It is the most theological and symbolic of the Gospels. The Gospel of John, in our theology class last week, we talked about Christology. That is the study of the nature and person of Jesus, how he was both fully God and fully human, the divinity and the humanity of Jesus. So John is much more blunt, he's much more upfront about his declaration that Jesus was divine. He calls him the Son of God. That's a title John uses more than any other of the Gospel writers. Um, the opening, the uh, prologue of the first chapter of John, and we're going to look at the structure of John shortly, um, talks about Jesus as the eternal word or logos in the Greek, which means it's not just the spoken word, it is the concept behind, it's the rationality that goes behind meaning. It's a Greek term, and I'll talk about that a little bit, but he leads to, he says, in the beginning was the word, which is Jesus, the word uh, was with God, and the word was God, and he goes on to say, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So John is much more upfront in his declaration that Jesus is the Son of God and divine. Now I want to start out talking about some of the ways in which John is different from the Synoptic Gospels. We've just said that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are of one type, sort of straightforward historical kind of telling of the story of Jesus. 
John is quite different. So let's talk for a few minutes about what differences there are between the two. <laughs> but yeah, I have I fiddled with that and fiddled with that. Someday we're actually going to have it where we don't have to move things over the weekend, so we'll be good. The first thing is to recognize that there is not a lot of common material between John and the Synoptic Gospels. In particular, John omits a lot of the material that are in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. For instance, John has no mention of the temptation of Jesus or the transfiguration of Jesus. The Lord's Supper is not talked about. There's no examples of Jesus casting out demons. There is no Sermon on the Mount as there is in Matthew. There is no Lord's Prayer. There are no narrative parables in John's Gospel. None of those things are included. And you go, well, what's left? Isn't that pretty much the whole thing? Well, there are materials in John's Gospel that conversely are not in the Synoptic Gospels. Particularly, John talks a lot more about Jesus' early Galilean ministry. The work that he did in Galilee, around the Sea of Galilee in the north, near his own home, his, his uh, childhood home of uh, Nazareth. There is a lot more reference to Jesus visiting Jerusalem. So more narrative about being in Galilean ministry, but also he's got several trips to Jerusalem. The Synoptic Gospels really only talk about the one trip to Jerusalem, and that's the one before Jesus' is death. Does somebody have a hearing aid that's singing? Just, just turn it down, if, you, if that's okay. That's all right. You don't have to take it out, just, just um, because I can hear it ringing. And I know sometimes if you have a hearing aid, people can't hear that. Uh, my father-in-law has that. So. Uh. so, and one of the things, I mentioned the fact that the Synoptic Gospels are only clear in that they refer to uh, one trip to Jerusalem. Uh, could you swing that around a little bit? I think we're crooked now. At least we can get it straight. There you go. Um, the, some people have said, well, the Synoptic Gospels are only one year in Jesus' life. Whereas John seems to be three years, somewhere between two and a half, and some scholars have said they can pick out what looks like four years. John very specifically talks about at least three different Passovers occurring during the time in which Jesus was uh, in his ministry. The, the, so we believe that John has three and almost four years worth of ministry. It's not really true that the Synoptic Gospels only suggest Jesus had one year of ministry. There are several places in them that they refer to things like sacrifices that could very well mean it was the Passover season, but they don't specifically talk about it being Passover. And so that's one of the ways in which it seems like that's a little different. As I mentioned to you, John has a much higher Christology, meaning he's, he's much more blunt and in your face about the divinity of Jesus. Again, that's not to suggest that the Synoptic Gospels do not, uh, are not clear on the fact that Jesus is the divine Son of God. All of them have those references. They have the confessions, for instance, of Peter. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. It's in there, but it's not as theological. It's not as... Um, in John, everything is absorbed by this idea of the divinity of Jesus. There's also a slight difference between in the Synoptic Gospels and... The uh, Gospel of John in that they're all three from the third person point of view. They're all talking about Jesus and they and he and whatnot. But the synoptics seem to be talking more in present tense as though they were watching or experiencing or viewing these events right now. John is very clearly talking third person past tense about things that happened previously. Now, um, and I'll come back to that. There's also, within John, you say, well, he has all these things he doesn't include, like the Sermon on the Mount and the, the, the temptation of Jesus and all of that. The reason why the Gospel of John is as full as it is, is he focuses a lot on long discourses. Not so much short interactions or proverbial kinds of sayings by Jesus, but long speeches. Um, Things like his, his discourse with Nicodemus, which takes the whole third chapter, where Jesus says, unless a, unless a person is born again, they cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. We have in, in John 4, a whole chapter's worth of interaction with the, the Samaritan woman at the well. In John 13 to 17, there's a four-chapter discourse on the bread of life. So John has these long passages. 
where he deals either with Jesus' interaction and teaching of individuals or with theological themes. There isn't sort of the one-liner kind of interactions that you get with Jesus and the disciples, for instance, in, in John. And it's also true that John uses a lot of symbolism and double meaning. Again, we said that, that it's the most symbolic of the Gospels. Um, he does a lot of referencing the, his body is equated with the temple, that the water and the spirit are equated with one another. The idea that he will be lifted up, um, which means to be crucified, and in do, being lifted up for crucifixion, he will be exalted. There's a lot of this double meaning kind of thing going on. So let me, let me talk a little bit now, stop me if you have any questions, about um, the background for John's Gospel. A little bit about who wrote it, um, where, when it was written, who it was written to, and in the process I want to get, come back to um, how the Gospel of John relates to, in terms of timing and interaction, with the Synoptic Gospels. I think there's a very specific reason why John is different than the Synoptic Gospels, and, um, and theologically I believe it's an evangelical reason, but it's the same thing that I'm going to talk about is what's caused a lot of scholars from the end of the 18th century till about 20 years ago to have serious doubts about the Gospel of John, of its reliability, of its historicity, and everything else. Up until about, well, up until the end of the 18th century, there was a fairly universal perspective that the Gospel of John had the best and most complete historical account of the life of Jesus, partly because He's much more methodical about it. Uh, scholars have gone through and they've said the synoptics sort of jump around. Jesus is here talking and then all of a sudden he's over here talking and then he's someplace else and we don't get a lot of connecting material in terms of his travel and whatnot. The Gospel of John, you can actually, you know, get on a camel and go from point A to point B according to what John says and the timeline works. There's a clearer sort of geographical and uh, chronological order to the things in John. And so up until, again, the end of the 18th century, there was a, a fairly universal idea that John was the most accurate and the most complete of the Gospels from a historical point of view. Then, at the end of the 18th century, they started having some questions about the historicity of John. Now, you will realize that the end of the 18th century was the time in which liberal theology started taking over. And they started saying, well, all of this stuff about him being God doesn't sound accurate to us. They started having questions, primarily because they didn't agree with the theology of John. And so from around 1800, you know, late 1700, that is the end of the 18th century, until about 20 or 30 years ago, it was common for scholars to say they, don't, they did not think this was written by John the Apostle. They did not think it was written in the first century. In fact, the Tübingen School, which was one of the most liberal of the German theological schools, said they thought it was written sometime late in the 200s or even in the 300s, which means John couldn't have written it. Um, and they basically dismantled any idea that this was a believable and reliable account of Jesus. And so scholars, for the longest time, were saying, if you want a historical study or a representation of the life of Jesus, you can't look at John. You can't trust John. Just forget John. Well, about 20 years ago, they started discovering some new things, and or at least rediscovering some things that they had found earlier, and began to rethink this whole idea about John. The, one of the things, for instance, that the liberal scholars had said was that John's gospel reflected Gnostic ideas. You know about Gnosticism? This was, I think we've mentioned it in classes. Gnosticism was this mystery religion idea that it would, that's the grandparent of our modern New Age movement. The idea was that a person, if Jesus wasn't divine, he wasn't a savior because you don't need a savior, you just need secret knowledge. That's what gnosis means, is knowledge. And so they had a lot of this, and, and so Jesus was represented in the Gnostic Christians as being the giver of knowledge, but not the savior, not divine. There are some pieces in John that they thought sound like Gnostic ideas, not in the sense that they don't acknowledge Jesus as divine, but some sort of sayings that sound Gnostic. And so the liberal scholars said he must have come in the 200s when those ideas were really developed. Well, there, was, um, there have been findings since then, for instance, the Dead Sea Scrolls, late 40s, early 50s. 
the Dead Sea Scrolls reflected some of the sort of mystical Jewish sayings from the, the first century before the time of Christ. But they represented the Jewish community, not the Gnostic community. And those same kinds of sayings are contained in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So scholars were saying, whoa, 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 this idea that that was, was sort of Gentile Gnostic and that John must have been written at the end of the 200s or early 300s can't, doesn't have to be true because those same ideas were present in the Jewish community, in the Essene community, because we've now discovered those same kinds of sayings in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Another thing that sort of really put the idea to bed that John was written so very late is the discovery of a piece of parchment which contains, um, it's written on both sides, it's a very small piece of parchment, it only contains about 18 words in Greek, but they're clearly from the Gospel of John. And even the most liberal of scholars date that no later than 125 AD, that piece of parchment. It was found in Egypt. Well, in order for John's Gospel, which would have been Jewish, it's written in Hebrew, to have gotten from Palestine or some other Jewish community down to Egypt, the transferal of that information, that doesn't happen immediately. Not in those days. You couldn't send it in an email attachment. So for it to have gotten from wherever it was written, which we think probably was Ephesus, a Jewish community in Ephesus, talk about that, to have gotten to Egypt and been buried and then rediscovered in the middle of the 20th century, likely it had to have been written 20 or 30 or 40 years prior to the dating of it as having been found in Egypt, which means they dated that to 125. The source document that led to it probably had to be written in, the, in 80 or 90, somewhere around there. It couldn't have been at the end of the 200s or into the 300s, like the liberal scholars try to say. So there have been several pieces of information just in the, the, the last century, but particularly interpreted in the last 20 years, that scholars are beginning to back up and go, wait a minute, wait a minute. Maybe this book was not written as late as we think. And so all of the reasons that they have had for trying to discount it having been written by John the Apostle are going out the window. And more and more scholars are beginning to line up with the fact that, you know, the traditional interpretation of this seems to be pretty accurate. So just in the last 20 years or so, that started to change. I want to talk to you a little bit now about what we believe about the author and dating and why, now that I've told you that the, the little of the history of the criticism. The Gospel of John does not say who wrote it. Internal to the document, and whenever we say a document is anonymous in the Bible, it doesn't mean we don't think we know who wrote it, it just it doesn't say who wrote it. In fact, that was customary in those days. Paul was something of an anomaly in that Paul usually said, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, writing to the church in Galatia, for instance. Most Jewish writers, most writers in the first century wouldn't do that. You didn't put your name uh, in the document. The reason Paul did is because these were letters to specific people, and you do put your name on a letter, but not on, say, a gospel, something that's supposed to be a representation of a general truth for people to, to uh, consume. We believe that the, um, although it doesn't say in the Gospel of John that this is John the Apostle, it does say in several places that this is the disciple whom Jesus loved. The writer in 21st chapter says, that this is the disciple whom Jesus loved who witnessed this and is recording it. Well, there are three different places that they refer to the disciple whom Jesus loved in the Gospel of John. One of them, particularly, is at the foot of the cross. When Jesus looks down and says, his mother Mary and the disciple whom he loved, that little description, mother, behold your son, son, behold your mother, the idea that, that he gave them to care for each other, he told them to take care of each other. Mother Mary and this disciple. That disciple has always been understood to be John. You know, the tradition is unchallenged that John the Apostle took care of Mary through the rest of her life. In fact, that she traveled with him to the city of Ephesus when he moved there, and that she had a house there. So, based upon that, the traditional view, which I hold very much to, and the evangelical view, which is gaining more credence now, is that this was written by John, not by somebody else. Not by a community that, of people who were like John and followed John or anything of that sort. The, the, what's called the Johannine, um, that's the word for 
from John. The Johannine scholarship, we believe, is pretty well satisfied. There is a lot of external evidence, meaning other people from the early days of the Christian church attesting to the fact that this was John the Apostle that wrote this. Irenaeus, who was born in A.D. 115, so he was middle of the second century, he uh, absolutely declares that everyone uh, knew that this gospel was written by John the Apostle, who was, who was the disciple whom Jesus loved. Irenaeus said he got that information from Polycarp, who was the bishop of Smyrna, one of the seven churches in Revelation. Polycarp was a very old man when he was martyred. Polycarp had known John personally. And there are several different people, uh, Irenaeus, Eusebius, others of the early church fathers, who said they, um, Polycarp would tell them stories about when he was a young man and John, the apostle, was an old man, and what he had learned from John, that it was John that inspired him in the faith and was his mentor. And so John told Polycarp, Polycarp shared it with everyone else. This is not like 200 years of mysterious linkages. This is, oh, there's only three links in that, from John to Polycarp to the people who were witnesses to Polycarp's testimony that John had written this gospel, as well as 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, the epistles, and the book of Revelation. Very short time after that, we also have testimony of the apostolic authorship by John of this gospel from Tertullian, from Clement of Alexandria, and from Origen, three other of the most famous of the early church fathers. In fact, the testimony of the early church was unanimous until the end of the 18th century that this gospel was written by John, the beloved disciple, uh, John the Apostle. Okay? Um, and I mentioned to you there... There, apparent, there appears to be internal evidence of that as well as that being the disciple that Jesus loved. Now, if you study this gospel, and this is important in terms of the authorship, because if this really was John the Apostle, the beloved Apostle, who was there with Jesus the whole time, and he wrote this, then that makes a huge difference in terms of its credibility, its reliability, and especially so because it is the one that is most adamant and direct about Jesus being the Son of God. So this is important. There are several factors within it which, which are pretty clear to us that this would have been John the Apostle. First, the author of this gospel is clearly Jewish. He refers to the messianic expectation of the Jews. He has a Jewish attitude toward women, or at least reflects that he understands how the Jews felt toward women. He understands the importance of Jewish schools. He, he understands and talks about the difference between the, the, the Hebrew Jews and the Hellenistic or the Greek Jews that he would not have been able to observe had he not been inside that community. And he understood completely the hostility and the reasons for the hostility between the Jews and the Samaritans. So he clearly reflects Jewishness in an understanding of the issues. He also understands the Jewish observances. He talks about ceremonial uncleanness, about the feasts, including the Feast of the Tabernacles especially, about the customs of the marriage feasts and of burial, all of these things that a Jew would understand and somebody who was outside the Jewish community wouldn't. Remember, the Jewish community was pretty closed. You didn't get invited to a Jewish wedding if you were Gentile because if you came into a, a Jew's house, you made it unclean. So there wasn't that kind of interaction. He would not have had those kinds of understandings unless he was part of the Jewish community. So we, we're quite confident he's Jewish, and his language reflects that. We also believe that his Jewishness is, is testified to by the fact that the Old Testament is so important to John in his references. Jesus quotes the Old Testament um, extensively. Now, the, I say this, the Jewish part of this, because that's one of the claims that the liberal theologians have made consistently, up until very recently, is that this, they think this was a Gentile, that this was not a Jew. It was written later in the Gentile church in a Gentile area. So establishing him as having been Jewish is critically important when we talk about the authorship of John. We also can tell that he was a Jew who was from Palestine. He was not from somewhere else because he has an intimate knowledge of the area of Palestine, the city of Jerusalem, the area in the north around Galilee. And this is one of the things that liberal scholars, until the last 50 years or so, they would say, oh, well, 
John makes this big deal about the man born blind. Jesus spits in some dirt, makes mud, puts it on his eyes, and, and says, Go in Jerusalem, go to the pool of Siloam, and wash it off, and you'll be healed. And he is. And they go, Well, there is no such pool. We've never found such a pool. Well, they found it in 2004. And it's right about where it would have been, according to John's testimony about it, according to that story. And so we're finding more and more and more the Pool of Beth uh, Bethesda, the Pool of Siloam, the uh, Wadi Kidron, and these very specific references to areas in and around Jerusalem, as well as places in the north. He was a Jew from Palestine. He lived there. He was not a Gentile who lived somewhere, somewhere else. Um, we also know that he was Jewish because it's, while he wrote this gospel like the others is in Greek, he doesn't quote from the Septuagint, the Greek he uses Greek translations of the Hebrew Bible, which were not exactly the same, and we can tell that. There are also a lot of details that suggest to us clearly that this person was an eyewitness of the events that he uh, describes. He describes people in minute detail, including fairly obscure people like Simon, the father of Judas Iscariot. He gives very specific detail about time, the number of days that, that occurred before he raised, Jesus raised Lazarus, the amount of time he spent in places, even specific hours in which events occurred. He gives a lot of details about numbers, how many disciples John the Baptist had, how many water pots there was at the wedding of Canaan, uh, how many loaves and fishes, how many soldiers. All of this clearly indicates that this person is giving detail because he witnessed it. He was there. You don't make up how many water pots there were unless you were there and experienced that. Um, we also believe that the evidence is clear that he was an apostle because he has a sense and of the scope of Jesus' ministry. His descriptions of the activities of Jesus are so very specific. He talks about the thoughts and the feelings of the other apostles and disciples, which he would not have had if he had not known them. He is familiar with particular places where the disciples were and where Jesus was at particular times. Um, he obviously was close to Jesus, and he was close to the other apostles. He understood what was going on with them. All of that together brings us to the place of saying, we believe, um, unquestioningly, I think, that this gospel was written by John, the beloved apostle, who was the closest to Jesus. It was, it was Peter, James, and John were the three that were closest to him, and uh, it was John who was declared to be the beloved disciple. Now, other people have said, well, maybe the beloved disciple was either Peter or James. Couldn't have been written by James because he was the first of the apostles to be martyred. And uh, that would have been far too early for him to have written this. It's not Peter because within the gospel they talk about Peter in the third person. So of the, of the ones closest to Jesus that would fit all of the criteria, John is the one that makes the, the only one that makes sense. Okay? Now, how does this fit in, then, with the other synoptic gospels in terms of timing, in terms of why is it so different? I think the answer to that is pretty obvious once you get into studying it. Obviously, there are a lot of scholars who don't think it's so obvious, or they wouldn't, you know, or, or they wouldn't say what they say. Um, the fact is, John lived longer than any of the other apostles. He was the youngest of the apostolic crew. And he lived longest. In fact, again, from the same people, we have testimony from Polycarp through Irenaeus, uh, Irenaeus excuse me, and Eusebius that John lived into the reign of Trajan, the Roman emperor. Well, Trajan took over as Roman emperor in AD 98. John was probably about 16 years old at the time of Jesus. He was, he was a young man, which explains why he could be standing there at the foot of the cross and not be getting getting in trouble with the Romans, because he was considered to be pretty much still just a boy. But at 16, that means he probably was born sometime around A.D. 15 or 16, somewhere in there. So if he lived until at least the start of the reign of Trajan the Emperor in 98, you know, from A.D. 15 to A.D. 98, we're looking at the fact that he lived into his 80s at least, and perhaps even longer. Now, the tradition is that the church leaders in Asia Minor, remember John went to Ephesus, which is in Asia Minor, what we call Turkey. In Ephesus, as an old man, 
the, the tradition is that the church leaders ask John to record his experience of Jesus. We believe that that happened somewhere around 80, 80 or 90, when John would have been in his 70s probably, an old man, but still, as I mentioned before, he was still active. He was being carried around by some of his acolytes to visit various churches, and he was the sort of patriarch of the churches in Asia Minor at that point. So they ask him, write down your experience. By that date, the other three synoptic gospels would have been available to him. And John, being by bent, very theological, he was a preacher, he was the, you know, the leader of the church, my sense is he didn't see a need to write another Jesus went here and he did this, and then he went there and he did that, and he went here and did that. Instead, John, having access and having read those three Gospels, which were written considerably for this, he decided to write what it meant. A lot of it is his own experience of Jesus, but the reason he's got these long discourses, and it's the most theological, he was intentionally not trying to replicate what already existed in three other documents. He was filling in the meaning behind it and telling the stories that weren't included in those because there were other things that he had seen and heard and experienced that Matthew, Mark, and Luke had not recorded. That, I believe, is why the Gospel of John is so fundamentally different. He wanted to give more of the theology. He saw need, no need to repeat what had already been written in the other three because he had them available to him in all likelihood. And he instead just added the stories that he knew that were not included in those. And that's why it's so very different. Did I see a hand? Question or comment about that? Does that make sense to you? Okay. Uh, it, it absolutely makes sense to me. I don't know where I put the quote, but uh, I read it to Carolyn. Was it this morning or last night? Carolyn? This morning. This morning. And some scholar had said that apparently John, writing as late as he did, and there's some scholars that say it may be as, as early as AD 70, but it was still after the other Gospels, that John writing when he did would have had access to the other Gospels. But that would mean that he couldn't have known Jesus personally, and couldn't have been an eyewitness, and so, and I'm going, what? And the reaction that I have when reading this kind of scholarship sometimes, it makes me crazy. And as I said to Carolyn, it's like, these guys study all the time, but they never stop to think. <laughs> if John wrote this, and even though there's huge differences still today about whether this really was John the Apostle, liberal scholars still don't think so, almost everybody agrees that it probably was written between 80, 80, and 90. 80, at 80, and 90, somewhere in there. Um, if that doesn't mean, that doesn't matter whether liberal or conservative, whether they believe he wrote it or didn't believe he wrote it, they all pretty much agree that's the timing on it. If that's true, and the timing on the other Gospels was earlier, then why do you assume that if he had access to those Gospels, he couldn't have been the person that, he, that the tradition says he was, John the Apostle? It just says, there's no reason to make that jump. Um, and it is just, it because they think that 50 years is just too long, you know, since Jesus' death, that he couldn't possibly have been alive that long? It doesn't, well, but, the, but, but history, <laughs> nobody, nobody questions that John lived that long. Every testimony is yeah. that John lived until at least the end of the first century, 98 AD, which is when Trajan takes over. And the, the, the most liberal of scholars don't disagree that that's how long John lived and that he was in Ephesus. But then they challenge whether or not he could have written this. Okay? There is some belief that it might have been. There are some scholars who are saying that it may have been as early as AD 70, and there's a reason for that, or right before AD 70, which doesn't, you know, from the point of view of its veracity, doesn't matter. The reason is because in AD 70, Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was destroyed. So the likelihood is that because John, who talks about Jerusalem and everything else, there is no reference in the Gospel of John to the destruction of the temple or the destruction of uh, Jerusalem, which was the most catastrophic thing you could imagine. Okay? It would be like, for, for Americans, it would be like Washington, D.C. being completely destroyed you know, by an enemy who now is squatting there. All right? And you were telling a history of the United States during this time, and you left that out. It wouldn't happen. So scholars say that either he wrote, say, 20 years later, when the dust had settled and there was no reason to refer to it again because it was just a given, everybody understood it, or he must have written right before that, before it actually happened. 
I lean toward the fact that it was probably written sometime in the late 80s, early 90s, somewhere in there, right around AD 90, when John was still alive, when he had access to the other synoptic gospels, and he was recording the experiences he had that were not in those, and then giving a theological understanding to it. Okay? Questions about any of that? Okay, let me talk a little bit about the content. You'll notice I have up here the theme is the, it's the most theological, most clearly evangelistic of the Gospels, emphatically presenting Jesus as God's divine Son and our Savior. Actually, I have it written here. I don't need to crane my neck around if I just find that sheet. Um, it... The purpose of it is to give both historical and theological support for the divinity of Jesus. And the, in terms of the breakdown of the book, there are um, a number of major themes. Let me go to this page to talk about that. Uh, you might think of this book as being in three parts. The first part being the witness. You're an axe. I'm an axe. <laughs> This is, I guess, what I want. Yeah. Um, there are a number of sections. The, the simplest way to think about the book of the Gospel of John is um, that there was a, there's a prologue that gives us an introduction to it. I have this somewhere because I'm looking at it. There we go. That's what I'm looking for. A prologue, which is the part where Jesus, said, where John says, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Then he gets into a section which he refers to, or has been referred to by scholars as the book of signs. It's from the 19th verse of the first chapter through the end of the 12th chapter. In it, Jesus is interacting with the various um, institutions of the, uh, the Jewish religion, and he performs seven major miracles. The seven miracles in this book of signs, this section of the first 12 chapters, include the first, which is Jesus changing water into wine. He then heals the official son. He heals the man at the pool of Bethesda. He feeds the 5,000. He walks on water. He heals the man born blind. And the, the seventh of the major miracles is raising Lazarus from the dead. And raising someone from the dead is, is seen as the capper. I mean, that's the... the up until his own resurrection from the dead. Raising Lazarus from the dead was the most significant of the miracles, and he sort of builds up to that. And so during this book of signs, we have Jesus interacting with the uh, Jewish institutions. Um, particularly, he is at a wedding ceremony in Cana. He's at the temple in Jerusalem. Um, he's interacting with uh, Nicodemus, the rabbi. He is... Uh, there's a conversation, two conversations with John the Baptist, although John, the, the gospel writer, never refers to him as John the Baptist. He just calls him John. He doesn't have the Baptist in there. The Samaritan woman at the well, and then returning back to Cana again. And so all of these pieces of interaction with the various, first with the institutions, and then he has interaction with Jewish festivals. We have Jesus um, referring to the Sabbath and commenting on the Sabbath, and then the Passover, the Feast of Tabernacles, then what we know as Hanukkah, the rededication of the Temple Festival, and then we have the return of John the Baptist. So we have very clear in interacting with Jewish institutions. You have very clear uh, interaction with the Jewish festivals. All of this brings out a clear understanding that John is giving us that Jesus is completing and fulfilling all of these various aspects of the Jewish faith. Uh, and again, these are some of the reasons why we say this, was, this is not a Gentile who lives you know, 250 years or more after this. This rather is a Jew who understood Palestine, understood the Jewish faith. And then there's a very strong uh, foreshadowing of Jesus' death and resurrection, a foretelling of it in the end of what's called the Book of Signs. This is a, a name that was given to it later. John doesn't call it that. But there's clearly a time of miracles and of interacting with the Jewish institutions and foretelling his own death. Then the second, uh, it's the third section, and include, if you include the epilogue, but the second big section is sometimes called the Book of Glory because it has to do with the end of Jesus' ministry. It's uh, John 13. In fact, a huge amount of John's Gospel has to do with just the last 
couple of weeks of Jesus' life. John 13 deals with the Passover meal, the foot washing, and the betrayal of Judas. Uh, Judas. Then we have the farewell discourse, which takes four chapters, where Jesus is talking about his, his leaving and how they need to prepare for that, about how he is the true vine, that the disciples um, are to, uh, how they are to relate to the world. There is the high priestly prayer in John 17, where uh, Jesus is praying to his Father, and he asks for blessings on the uh, the apostles. So we have a very strong sense of Jesus preparing his disciples before his death. We then have the account of the suffering and death of Jesus, his arrest, his interrogation, his crucifixion and burial, and then we have the resurrection. All of those sections are considered part of what's called the Book of Glory, John 13 to 21. And then we have the epilogue, which is the resurrected Jesus interacting with his disciples and it leads up to the, the time between the resurrection and the ascension, and the gospel um, ends with an acknowledgement of the divinity of Jesus again. Okay, so those four sections give you a sense of what the gospel of John is about. Any questions about any of that? The two main ones are the signs and the glory. Jesus proving his divinity and interacting with the Jewish festivals and institutions of the day, and then the preparation for his death and the declaration that he would be returning. Okay. Now I have a couple of passages here that would have to be considered the primary or the most important key verses from the Gospel of John. First from John 1, 1 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. You don't get more of a direct Christology than that. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. This is John the Baptist, not John the writer of this. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. It came to that which was his own, but its own, his own did not receive him. That's the Jewish people. Yet to all who received him, those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then we have at the end, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may, well, you might be saved, okay? Um, you may have life in his name. You may have life in his name, there you go. Um, I didn't remember the exact words, but it's that, so that you can be saved. Okay, you can have life. Um, so this start and end, both are declarations of the divinity of Jesus, that he is the Son of God. Uh, that was the whole focus. That is the key to understanding what the Gospel of John is all about. Questions about the Gospel of John? I know I gave you a lot of technical detail in there, but it, it's important for us to have a sense of what scholars, both conservative scholars and liberal scholars, say about books like the Gospel of John, because you're going to be reading about this, and you're going to read somebody saying, oh, well, nobody really believes that anymore. Yes, actually, they do. Okay. Um, there was a long period of time in which there were very few people who defended the traditional understanding that this is written by John the Apostle, that this is someone who witnessed and experienced himself the miraculous life and sacrifice, uh, <coughs> death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus, and that he perhaps was the closest of all of Jesus' friends and followers. And so what we have here is the most complete picture of the divine presence of Jesus, the Son of God. Scholars who want to just throw that away, you have to have some understanding of why it is that we don't accept that, that we think there is, there is veracity to it. And as I say, in the last 20 years, more and more is being written and done. More and more scholars are coming along and saying, no, we think this 
this really was written by John, like everybody said. Um, I had one. I am all, my notes are all mixed up up here. Who did this? <laughs> Sorry. I think I know. It's all my fault. It's all Carol's fault. <laughs> it's all like my fault. Yeah. Okay, here you go. This is what I was looking for. Um, one scholar has said, this is D.A. Carson, who wrote a book called The Authorship of the Fourth Gospel, the Gospel According to John. He said, denying Johannine authorship, again, that means that John the Apostle wrote it, requires virtual dismissal of all the external evidence. That means from Polycarp's testimony to Irenaeus and Eusebius and others for 1,800 years, you have to just throw all that away if you, just, if you want to say this wasn't John that wrote this. This is particularly regrettable. Most scholars of antiquity, were they assessing the authorship of some other document, could not so easily set aside the evidence that is so plentiful, consistent, and plainly tied to the sources as is the external evidence that supports Johannine authorship. And another uh, writer just recently, 2009, so four years ago, Craig Bloomberg, who wrote a, uh, the Gospel of John in Jesus and the Gospels, wrote, all of this evidence adds up to strong circumstantial indication that equates the beloved disciple with the Apostle John. So more and more scholars are beginning to say now, this was John. This was John the Apostle. And therefore, the most intimate, probably, of all the gospel writers. Bob? Who gave the name to the book? Um, the naming occurred, for most of these books, came in the 2nd and 3rd century. This stuff was all sort of nailed down. Um, by, the, by 180, the, the, a bishop of the church declared that these four gospels were the four testimonies. And then later on, a lot was written about them being representing the four corners of the earth and the four winds and all kinds of stuff. But usually, it was the, the name that was given just sort of started being used by the local church because of the tradition. Again, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the tradition on all four of those go back very, very early to the second century at the latest. Now, this one going back to the first century. Um, in fact, that, that passage, that, that piece of Parchment that I mentioned, that's dated at 125, that is the oldest extant uh, uh, document we have of the New Testament, right? Meaning, we've got other copies that come later, but that's the oldest piece we have. So, as far back in that case, as the end of the first century, early second century, they were beginning to refer to this as the Gospel of John, because that's what the tradition was, and they had to call it something. The Old Testament, the names of the Old Testament, come from the first Hebrew words in the Old Testament. Genesis, or origins, that's the first word in the book of Genesis. Okay? And so they would take the first word, and that became the name of the book. In this case, they based it upon either who the author was, traditionally, and they assigned that very early, or in the case of, like, Paul's letters, who they were being written to, um, the letter to the Galatians. This is the gospel according to John. And so it was just an accrual of tradition, but a tradition that goes back very, very far. Other questions about this? All right, let's take a break for 10 minutes. We'll start back at 2 o'clock, and we'll talk about the Acts of the Apostles. All right, let's continue now the discussion discussing the Acts of the Apostles, which is the official name. We usually just call it Acts or the Book of Acts. But it's technically called the Acts of the Apostles. Um, to Bob, you had asked the question as to when did this stuff name this. Well, it started being called the Acts of the Apostles in the second century. Irenaeus, the same guy that we talked about earlier, who testified to the uh, Joanine authorship of the Gospel of John, is the one who started referring to this <coughs> as the Acts of the Apostles. There have been some uh, people who have claimed over the years it should better be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but Acts of the Apostles it is. That is the historic name for it. Uh, there is a traditional type of literature, a Greek literature, called Acts, which were acts of great people, particularly or even of, of gods. And so Acts was a genre of literature. And so this testimony to the miraculous way in which God worked through the Apostles, the Holy Spirit worked through the early leaders in establishing and growing the church, is what the book of Acts is all about. 
Let's talk a little bit again about the authorship and then we'll get into some of the content. Uh, traditionally, this book is understood to be authored by Luke the Evangelist. Um, somebody asked me at the break, why do we have to put why do we have to put credence in all of these liberal, liberal scholars? We don't. I want to make sure you all are clear on that. I'm not telling you about some of the liberal interpretations of this stuff because we somehow give that credence or we get we put any weight on that. But the fact is, between late 1700s and mid 20th century, for about 150 or 60 years in there, liberal scholars were the only ones who were working on this stuff. I mean, the liberal ideas had taken over so much. It's only been in the last 50 to 60 years that more conservative scholarship has taken hold, mostly, that we've taken it seriously and said, look, we don't have to just kowtow to a much more liberal interpretation that basically rips the any divine inspiration or uh, any sense in which this is a canon given by God out of it. And so the reason we recognize what the liberal scholars have said is because that was so dominant for so long and it's still so common that if we don't know some of what they said, we don't know how to respond to that. How many college students go off to college and because they have never been introduced to some of the some of these kinds of ideas, their faith gets blown away because they have no way to respond to it. They're completely surprised by it. Part of our job is not to be surprised by it. And so 2 Peter says, be always prepared to give an explanation for the hope that is in you, but to do so with gentleness and kindness. If we're going to give an explanation for the hope that is in us, we have to know the arguments. When I used to do debate. And in debate, one of the most important things you can do is figure out what the other side is going to argue so that you know how to respond to it. That's why we look at some of the dominant liberal ideas, so we know how to respond to it. Okay. Bless you. So the tradition of the writer of the book of Acts being Luke, that is the same Luke, who was the Gentile physician, the companion of Paul, who wrote the Gospel of Luke, this goes back to the very early church fathers. Um, Luke is an individual who's introduced to us in particularly referred to in Colossians in the fourth chapter, Paul identifies Luke as one of his most important companions. He identifies him as a Gentile as well. Um, we, because we believe that Luke wrote this as a second book, we know that he was a companion of Paul's because in the 16th chapter of Luke, the pronouns change. If you were in our Bible study when we went through the, the Luke, we talked about that. Up until the 16th chapter, the writer of Acts, we believe to be Luke, says they and he. Well, starting in the 16th chapter, when they crossed over from Asia Minor into Macedonia, basically from Asia into Europe, he starts saying we. And so we know that was the point at which the writer, which we believe is Luke, the, the physician, started traveling with Paul and became a companion of his. And there was a period of time uh, when apparently Luke was not with him after the first captivity in uh, Paul's first captivity in Rome, but later on they joined back up again together and tradition has it that Luke was with him right up until the time of his death. So, um, again, no tradition up until recent liberal scholarship suggests anything other than that this is the Luke which was introduced to us in Colossians. He's mentioned in other places in the, the writing of Paul. Now, there's also a very clear connection in terms of literary style and content between the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. Both of them start with a dedication, for instance, in the prologue that identifies that they are writing this for the purpose of uh, Theophilus, literally means um, the lover of God, and that this person is named, is given by name. Now in the old days when somebody would write, they, they would have a patron, somebody would support them. And they would write, they would dedicate the things that they wrote or the, the pieces they created. Michelangelo had patrons to support his painting and, you know, various things. In those days, if Luke is a physician, physicians were not wealthy back then. In fact, physicians often were slaves. Um, it was, and frequently they also were barbers. You know that for some strange reason. The early surgeons were always barbers. It's like, okay, take a little off the side and my appendix is bothering me. Okay. Um, but... <laughs> So Luke would not have been wealthy. He probably had a patron. It may have been Theophilus. In the start of the Gospel of Luke and in the prologue of the book of Acts, he says the same, he introduces it in basically the same way. The start of the book of Acts is this. In my former book, 
that is the Gospel of Luke, Theophilus, he names him, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up into heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. So the, uh, the author, Luke, wrote the Gospel of Luke. He wrote the book of Acts. The style is the same. The idea is that his first volume was the life and ministry of Jesus. The second volume is the creation and blessing and growth of the church. And that's what the book of Acts is all about, is the early church. The um, purpose that we have is to show that the Old Testament promises of God are fulfilled, that Jesus was and is the Messiah, and is shown in a miraculous way that God, because God blesses and expands the church in the early days. Um, now, the title, as I said, was given to this book in the second century by Irenaeus. Um, some people have said it should be the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Some people have said it should even be the Acts of Jesus, perhaps, because it was as a result of his teaching that all of this, these things happened. But um, the purpose we have here is not agreed to by everyone. There are some liberal scholars who don't agree as to exactly why Acts existed, but we, um, if we consider it along with the book of Luke as being the product of the same author, in fact, as being one longer book, there's some suggestion even that the Luke intended to write a third book because of how abruptly he ends the book of Acts. When you get to the end of the book of Acts, the 28th chapter, Paul has just been, he's gotten to Rome, he's testified in Rome, he's in prison in Rome, and then it just stops. And the idea was that Luke may have intended to continue and write more about it. But the fact that it stops so abruptly with Paul in jail in Rome gives us a real clear idea uh, as to when the book was written. Because Paul was imprisoned sometime around 62 or 63 AD, pretty close parameters there. And we believe because of the fact that it ends abruptly that the book was written right at that time. It doesn't tell us what Paul did after that. It doesn't, you know, but it just goes that far. So we believe this book was written sometime, A.D. 62, 63, maybe as early as 61, but that that was when this book was written. Now, that's important because we can identify fairly specifically that date if we then back up from there, knowing that the Gospel of Luke was written before this book was written, and this book was finished in A.D. 61 to 63, that means that the Gospel of Luke had to be written sometime earlier than that, not in the middle of the second century, like the liberal scholars used to try to say. That doesn't work if we, because we can pinpoint when Paul was imprisoned and then work back from there. This book, there's two ideas as to where it was written. Some, it obviously was written to the whole church because it's the story of the entire church and the growth of the church and God's blessing. It wasn't targeted to a specific location so much. It is quite universal. It's not just for Jews, it's not just for Gentiles. It doesn't address the needs in a particular location the way some of the books in the New Testament do. This book, some scholars say that it was written in Rome because that's where it ends, with Paul in Rome. And Luke accompanied him, apparently, because when he's on board the ship going to Rome and they have the shipwreck and all of that, again, the pronouns are all we. And so we have a sense that Luke was with Paul during that whole arduous trip and the, you know, the danger of death at shipwreck and all kinds of things. Because it ends there, some people have said it was written in Rome. There are others who have suggested that it might have been written in Asia Minor, particularly, again, Ephesus. You begin to get a sense of how important Ephesus was in New Testament times. You know, John was there. John the Apostle was there. Um, Mary the mother of Jesus was there. Timothy was there. You know, that he was the pastor of the church that Paul had planted there. Paul visited there. Paul spent more time in Ephesus at one stretch than any other place he went. Um, the suggestion is that this book may have been written there as well. So you got to go to Ephesus. All right? it's, it's the most extraordinary um, place imaginable. Okay. But the reason that some people have thought that it might have been written in Ephesus is because there's a, a very high degree of concern in the Gospel, or in the, the book of Acts, about what's happening in Ephesus. And not only Ephesus, but in Asia Minor, talking about the churches of Asia Minor. And the suggestion, and it's only a suggestion, is that that level of concern may have been on the mind of Luke when he was writing this. 
But my money is probably on the fact that it was written in Rome because of the fact that it ends in Rome with Paul in jail. We don't have any subsequent writing to talk about that. There's two ways you can think about the structure of the book of Acts. Um, one of them is to think in terms of the witness. Remember the great commission that was given by Jesus is, you will testify to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and the uttermost uh, parts of the world. Well, you can actually take the book of Acts and break it down that way. And think in terms of the first eight chapters, or the first seven chapters in the beginning of chapter eight, as being the witness in Jerusalem because it's, it starts in Jerusalem. Then there's the, the travels of Philip the Evangelist and Peter in Judea and Samaria. And then we get Paul coming in and testifying throughout the pretty much the known world. Asia Minor, um, the western part of Europe, that is in what we know as Greece today, uh, and then all the way to Rome, all the way to Italy. Another way you can think of it is even simpler is to think of the book of Acts as being, um, for the most part, and this is a generalization, the story of Peter and of Paul. The first 12 chapters are primarily focused on Peter. Now there are other people in there. We have the story of Stephen, we have the story of uh, Philip the evangelist, again we have some other things in there, but it's, Peter is the star of the first 12 chapters of the book of Acts. Starting with the 13th chapter, we have a focus on Paul. The, the evangelist to the Gentiles, beginning in chapter 13 with the first of the missionary journeys. Now, Paul is converted. He's, he becomes a Christian uh, earlier in the book, but he actually becomes the focus as a minister starting in the 13th chapter. Chapters 13 to 21, his missionary journeys, and then from chapter 21 to 28, we have Paul at Rome and the events that, well, the events that lead up to that, sort of from Antioch to Rome. And so you might think of it as first 12 chapters are about Peter and the things surrounding Peter. The last uh, from chapter 13 to 28 is about Paul. Um, let me give you a couple of key verses here. Actually, several key verses. From the 8th verse of the first chapter, this is the resurrected Jesus speaking. Now, the Gospel of Luke ends with the ascension. Got the resurrection, the teaching of Jesus between his resurrection and his ascension. The 40 days in there, and then he is resurrected. Now we have the book of Acts picking up, slightly overlapping. You know, it starts out with the dedication of Theophilus, and then it says this is, this is what, Jesus, what happened after Jesus' resurrection. But we have in the prologue a testimony to, again, the end of Jesus' teaching and the witnessing of, uh, of the crowd of him being ascended into heaven. So... Acts 1.8 is Jesus speaking and saying, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. See, that's where I broke, how I sort of broke up one way of thinking about this, as being in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, sort of in an outward growth. It's interesting that the Gospel of Luke starts globally. It starts by talking about who the Roman emperor was. Okay, in, in, in the days of, you know, uh, and the uh, survey was held and all of that. And then it sort of begins to focus in and in and in until finally it ends in Jerusalem. Then the same writer, Luke, with the book of Acts, there's a chiasm here or a sort of reversing, which starts in Jerusalem and then Judea and then Samaria and then the other most parts of the earth. So these two books by Luke sort of reverse each other from, from the broadest general global idea down to just Jerusalem at the time of the death of Jesus and then Acts from Jerusalem expanding outward until it's the whole known world. Um, another key verse would be from Acts 2. Men of Israel, listen to this. This is uh, the second chapter of Acts is the birth of the church. Because that is when the Holy Spirit, which Jesus had promised, promised in verse 8 there, when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples, the apostles and other disciples, who were gathered in Jerusalem, and they were empowered by the Holy Spirit, which was testified to by the sound of wind, of like, uh, like tongues of fire, and the speaking in tongues. And the reason why speaking in tongues is quite often, there are several places, this one being the primary one, where speaking in tongues is the sign of the Holy Spirit coming upon them, 
is because speaking in tongues is the most visible and obvious of the gifts of the Spirit. Some denominations, I believe, have made the mistake of thinking that if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you have to speak in tongues. Paul, I believe, is very clear that that's not true. He says, do all prophesy? Do all interpret? Do all speak in tongues? It's an, the questions are clearly, the answer to them is no. The Holy Spirit gives gifts individually. Speaking in tongues just happens to be the one that is most visible and obvious, that you can't really deny because it's kind of strange. And so, when God the Holy Spirit wants to make sure that everybody around knows that He's there, He doesn't give somebody the, the, you know, the gift of teaching, necessarily, because that could just be somebody who's a good teacher, or the gift of administration, or the gift of hospitality. The gift of tongues is such an obvious and noticeable and undeniable kind of evidence of the Holy Spirit that when he wants to make sure that everybody around knows that the Holy Spirit is present, speaking in tongues is the gift that is evident. Okay? So, second chapter of Acts, they have spoken in tongues. We have the first great sermon of Peter, which led to thousands believing in Jesus. And it started, Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited to you by God, by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him. And you yourselves, as you yourselves know, this man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. Notice that God knew what he was doing in this. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Remember, Christ means Messiah. It means anointed one, the Holy One of Israel. This was when the church was born. And this was the first, only the first of Peter's great sermons. He preaches again later after the Sanhedrin tries to suppress him. And uh, 2,000 more people come to believe in Jesus. So throughout the first 12 chapters, mostly in Jerusalem and just beginning to go out from there into Judea and Samaria, which was north, we have mostly Peter. We also have John evident in the ministries here. Uh, we have Philip, as I said, and some others who are preaching and ministering as they go around. You know, Philip the evangelist who met with the Ethiopian eunuch. Um, uh, so that's... That's the start of this. Another passage from Acts 2. When the people heard this, this is a continuation actually, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. <coughs> With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. That's where the church is born. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is when the church started. Okay. So from the, as I mentioned, the initial prologue, the church names uh, Matthias to replace Judas so that they, are, they have the twelve. And they move on from there to the second chapter, where is what this happens. Rich? No. You had a question? Okay. Now, I, yes, Mary. Uh, when the people around um, the disciples heard them speaking in tongues, weren't they hearing them all talking in their own languages from around the whole area? Yeah, speaking in tongues, I mean, we'll, we're getting into the gifts of the Spirit here a little bit. The indication, because it was the Passover season, and people from all over the Eastern Mediterranean had gathered in Jerusalem. That is, Jews who were part of the Jewish diaspora, the spreading out that had happened. You will remember from our history classes, you know, from uh, 
the Babylonian exile when people were the whole Jews were taken out of the Holy Land and ended up many of them stayed in Babylon, many of them traveled out other places. That was one of the great diasporas were spreading out. They had come to Jerusalem for the Passover. In fact, Jewish Jewish men and ideally bring their families, but Jewish men were supposed to be required to come to the Passover. So there were people there from all different lands who spoke all different languages. And they said they heard their own language being spoken by these disciples of Jesus when the Holy Spirit came on them. There are other indications. Some of it may have sounded like gibberish to people who didn't know those particular languages because they say, it's only 9 o'clock, these people are drunk. And then Peter gets up and says, they're not drunk, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. You know, Here's what's happening. And he explains it to them. But later on, we have examples of the in, in the New Testament of Paul talking about the fact, speaking in tongues in a language that's not understandable unless someone interprets it. So there appears to be two different ways in which the Holy Spirit manifests tongues um, based upon those different references. Okay? So we have Peter, who along with John, performs miracles in Jerusalem after this. Um, he makes lame to walk. They do healings. They cast out evil spirits. They even raise the dead. And because of that and the testimony that's occurring, thousands of people convert to Christianity and are baptized. And it's interesting that this is a place where it says that men and women were coming to faith. The, it's the first time that, um, certainly in the history of the Jewish people, that women were acknowledged as being able to make their own decision about this kind of stuff. You know, it's very important. Uh, Jesus was the great equalizer between men and women. He spoke to women in public. He honored women in terms of respect for them. Um, Mary and Martha and uh, the, the Samaritan woman at the well, and etc. Uh, Peter, likewise, there was an openness. And then Paul comes along. And despite the fact Paul has gotten a bad rap, Paul was a great advocate for women in ministry. Okay? He, he recognized women as having the gift of prophecy, which he said was the highest of all spiritual gifts. He identified women as being co-laborers in the ministry. Um, so... One of the things that we see in the early church, which unfortunately the apostolic fathers lost. Women took a, took a secondary role again after the apostolic age when we got to the early church fathers. Origen finally ruled that, yes, women had a soul and could be saved. Uh, uh, wow. <laughs> Luke in particular seems to have a, an affinity for, for women. He, he mentions them a lot. He does. In fact, there's several major themes which are present in the Gospel of Luke also are present in the book of Acts, which are sort of unique kind of marks, which is one of the things I said that there's a consistent style. The universality of Christianity, that it is both for Jews and for Gentiles, is something that is both in Luke's Gospel and it's in the book of Acts. One of the major events early on uh, in the history of the church was the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15. What was happening is Paul, after he is saved, he goes up to Antioch uh, with Barnabas. They preach the gospel, and Gentiles get saved. <gasps> Gentiles get saved. And so the, the next thing that happens is some of the Jewish Christians, remember all of the original, all of the first Christians were all Jewish. Some of the Jewish Christians say that for a Gentile to be a follower of Jesus, they have to obey the Jewish law. They have to get circumcised. They have to obey the kosher laws of eating, etc., etc., particularly the circumcision thing, and they have to obey the Sabbath laws. So Paul is one of the ones who says, why? We're not under the law anymore, and a lot of Paul's theology of the change from the old law, the law of Moses, to the law of love, which Jesus represented, was based upon that conflict, the fact that there was an issue of, do Gentiles have to become Jews in order to be saved? Well, um, finally that issue was brought back to Jerusalem, to the Jerusalem Council, which was the board of elders for the church at that point. That was the session, if you will. The, the head of the Jerusalem Council was James, the brother of Jesus, who wrote the, gospel, the, uh, the epistle of James. Well, they, they come down, and the Judaizers, they were called, meaning they wanted everybody to become Jewish. If they were Gentile, they wanted to be, become Jewish in order to be saved. Uh, the Judaizers make their argument as to why these Gentiles had to be circumcised to be Christians. Paul makes his argument, and it's interesting that at one point, we, later in Acts, we find out that, that later Peter actually gets convinced wrongly about this, and Paul has to go back to Jerusalem and smack Peter around and straighten him out. Okay? Even Peter got this wrong under pressure. 
the decision of the Jerusalem Council under James, and that's in Acts 15, one, it's a major turning point, for, again, for the church. Almost every chapter in Acts has some major aspect of the establishment and growth of the church. But the Jerusalem Council declares in Acts 15 under James that no, a Gentile does not have to be circumcised or obey the law in order to become a Christian. They do say to those Gentiles who are becoming Christians, there are a few things that, that we think you need to be careful about. Don't eat food sacrificed to idols, you know, and, and several other things. Not because that was necessary to be saved, but because those were the things that Jews had the most problem with Gentiles about. And it, it was so that their witness would be acceptable. If a Gentile had said they believed in Jesus and the Jews saw them doing things like eating, blood, eating food sacrificed to idols or eating um, meat with blood still in it, actually the text says meeting, eating meat taken from a living animal is what it says, because apparently they used to do that. Um, they said don't do those things because if you do, you'll blow your witness. You know, the Jews, if you, they see you doing that, they will reject Jesus, the Jesus whom you serve. So don't do those things. So it was an issue of witness, not of getting saved. But that Acts 15 is a huge turning point in terms of we should all be grateful for, or we wouldn't be part of the faith. Okay, that was what made it possible for Gentiles. So the universality of the Christian faith is a major theme, both in God, the Gospel of Luke and in his uh, book of Acts. Also, a huge emphasis on the Holy Spirit, a huge emphasis on the oppressed and the persecuted and caring for them, a major emphasis in both the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts on prayer as a major motif, and the book of Acts especially contains a number of these, these huge speeches, like what we refer to here. Uh, there are 24 extended speeches or sermons in the book of Acts. Peter, most often, and Paul, but you also have Philip. You have the wonderful testimony of Stephen right before his martyrdom uh, in the book of Acts. So there was a big emphasis on those things. But you do see very clear similarities between what Luke wrote in his gospel and what he wrote in the book of Acts as part of the early church in terms of major themes. Now, as I said, Peter is in the first 12 chapters primarily and then sort of recedes into the background somewhat and the focus turns to Paul and his ministry in the 13th chapter. Paul, of course, had been Saul of Tarsus Tarsus was a town in Cilicia, which was a province, a Roman province. Um, if, if you picture the Mediterranean Sea, right? And Palestine is right here. I should have a map for you. Cilicia was just on the north side where the coastline of the Mediterranean Sea turns west. Picture that? Cilicia was just above that. So Tarsus, the town that Paul came from, was not too far away from Antioch, which is why Antioch is the place where the, the first... Gentile church really got planted. That was a major site for Paul because it wasn't too far away from his hometown. Um, and that's where Barnabas and he did a lot of their ministry. It was sort of a base of operations for them as they went out from there. But Saul, the story I mentioned about Stephen's martyrdom, Saul had been, as he said, a Jew of Jews of the tribe of Benjamin, you know, circumcised on the eighth day. He was a young Turk leader amongst the Jewish people. It's a strange word to use for it, I guess, young Turk. But you know the expression, young Turk. Um, the, he was the up-and-comer in terms of a strict Pharisaical follower of the law, so much so that the Sanhedrin commissioned him as this energetic, righteous, young Jewish man to, to persecute and to prosecute as well these followers of this new sect, Christianity. And so... Paul is present at the stoning of Stephen, and it's said that in, in their, their rabid enthusiasm to stone Stephen, they all took off their cloaks and left them with Saul, and he witnessed the stoning of Stephen. Immediately after that, he gets up, gets on his donkey, heads off toward um, the Damascus, because he had heard that some of the Jews who were following Jesus, when the persecution started, they'd run off to Damascus. So he went to try to <coughs> arrest them. On the road, we have the experience, of course, of uh, uh, Saul hearing a voice from heaven, bright light that blinds him, knocks him off of his ride. He uh, hears a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And, and Saul calls him Lord, says, Lord, who are you? And he has a vision of the risen Christ. He's blinded, 
his, his friends who heard something but didn't see anything, they didn't know what was going on, they take him in and he stays in Damascus for a while and God sends someone to take care of, to Ananias, a man named Ananias, to come minister to him, telling him about Jesus, helping him understand what he's just experienced, and to heal him from his blindness. And that was the start of the ministry of Paul. Now, we do have quite a bit going on. That happens, you know, the, he's a persecutor of the church in the 8th chapter. But then later on, after he's converted, he takes some time to study. The church didn't want to accept him at first because he'd been a persecutor. It's Barnabas, who was trusted by everybody, is the one who finally gets them to accept Paul. And the two of them are companions together. And then starting in the 13th chapter, 13th and 14th chapter, we have Paul, his name changed. In the scripture, whenever there's a major change in somebody's life, they frequently change their name. Abraham became Abram, Sarai became Sarah, Jacob became Israel, Saul became Paul. Um, and we have, you know, Peter was not originally called Peter. He was Simon, and Jesus renames him Peter. The changing of a name is a major, is a mark of a major event, a spiritual event. The Catholic Church may still do this until recently, I know, when someone um, went through confirmation, they were given a new name, right, Dean? That's correct. Okay, and so that was a sign in the Catholic Church. When somebody enters orders, holy orders, uh, as a monk or a, or a nun, they're given a new name. Uh, I had a good friend named Paul Ford, who was the founder of the uh, C.S. Lewis Society in California, and has written some books about that. Uh, Paul became a monk. I mean, he was a monk for about 10 years. And when he became a monk, they changed his name to Peter. <laughs> I thought, wasn't Paul good enough? <laughs> but they had to change it because that was a sign of a significant thing where he had taken orders. Later on, he asked and, and was given permission to be released from orders um, and came back out into the world, so to speak. So starting with that first missionary journey in chapter 13, Paul and Barnabas leave Antioch. They cross over to the island of Cyprus and from there come back over to Asia Minor and they travel through and they plant churches. They go back and visit those churches on the way back. Then they're getting ready for a second trip. While they were on that first trip, John Mark, who we believe, I believe firmly, is the author of the Gospel of Mark. John Mark had deserted them when they made landfall in Asia Minor. And it may be because that was the point at which Paul started taking preeminence over Barnabas. And John Mark was a cousin of Barnabas. It may be because he didn't like the fact that Barnabas wasn't in charge anymore. Barnabas didn't seem to mind. But Paul started becoming the preeminent one, the main spokesperson. John Mark had left them and deserted them in mid-trip later on. And so Paul did not want John Mark to go on their second trip. Barnabas did. And Barnabas and Paul split up. They, didn't, they weren't enemies. In fact, they, they had hard words, apparently. But they got back together later. We find out later in, in Paul's writing. So Paul and Barnabas went to Cyprus again. Or sorry, Paul, Paul and uh, Barnabas and John Mark went to Cyprus again. Paul went overland to visit churches in Asia Minor. So he ended up having three missionary journeys, which covered almost all of Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, which was a real center for the Christian faith um, for up until the Ottoman Turks invaded, um, and then crossed over into Macedonia, which was in what we know as Greece, and uh, ended up with starting churches in Berea and Philippi, in Corinth, um, witnessing to Christ in Athens, at the Areopagus, Mars Hill, as we sometimes call it, to the philosophers in Athens. And so he had three missionary journeys. Then after his third missionary journey, he hurried back to Jerusalem because he wanted to be there for the Passover. He ends up, the Jews recognize him as somebody they think is trying to destroy the Jewish faith. They grab him, they're beating him up. The Romans come out of Antonia Forest and uh, Fortress and uh, grab him and take him off to save him. He ends up being tried before the Sanhedrin, later on is taken to Caesarea, which is the center for the Roman uh, guards, the Roman army in that area, is tried there before the governor, is held there for two years until a new governor comes along, and then he appeals to Rome, which was his right as a Roman citizen, and that leads to his fourth major trip, which is the trip that takes him to Rome. The book of Acts ends after that Roman trip, while Paul is in jail. But tradition, we don't have any other writings about it, but strong tradition is that Paul was not executed that, at that time when he was imprisoned in Rome. But in fact, that he went on to be released from prison and to have another missionary trip that took him as far as Spain because he had declared his intention to go to Spain. Some tradition has him going as far as Great Britain 
which was part of the Roman Empire, and so therefore it was feasible. And then coming back again, he later was arrested again, and it's believed that sometime around AD 69, so that would be about six years or so after the arrest, uh, his imprisonment in Rome that is at the end of the Book of Acts, that it was about five or six years later that he was arrested, and this time he was executed. Okay? Um, yes? There are some other witnesses of, of this time of... Um, Paul, I don't know if it was the book of Josephus, or uh, it was, there were some other writings. Suetonius, yes. They spoke of Paul and, and spoke of, you know, some, some of the things were very in general, but they were witnesses of. Right. Um, I'm, his, uh, you got me a little bit because I can't think of references to Paul. There are references to Christ. Right. Uh, they refer to him as Christus. Josephus was a Jewish, um, actually a Jewish military commander, who when the Romans invaded, when Pompey came in, remember the first part of this, we talked about the history, in AD 63 when Pompey comes in and he is sweeping down, the Roman general, and he's sweeping down to take over, he takes over the northern part of Palestine first around Galilee, and Josephus was a military leader, and when the Romans beat him, he decided to change sides. So he ended up joining the Romans as a historian. And so he wrote the Annals of the Jewish Wars, it's called. Um, in that, and then he wrote some other things as well later, um, in that he talks about this sect that grew up around this Crustus, who was a troublemaker. There's another passage in which he seems to say exactly the opposite about Jesus, where he was a great man of miracles and some claimed he was the Messiah, etc. But the style is so different and the content is so opposite, most people believe that that was added by somebody later, a Christian later. But he does identify the historicity of Jesus, Crestus as he calls him, as being a religious leader. Suetonius is another historian of the time, which also does the same. Now, I'm probably wrong about that, but let me see if I can find some references to Paul as a historical figure. I'm not I, I sure. Know it, was a, it was about 10 years ago when I was studying Paul, because he's like my favorite person in the whole right. of I just love the the whole story of his um, change of right. how God touched him and he he did what he did. Um, and I and I thought it was uh, there was so much a kind of witness of how Paul was um, actually um, he had how his life ended. But I can't remember what book or... Well, let me see what I can find out. There are, as I say, there are traditions within the, within the Christian faith of him traveling as far away as Spain or maybe even Great Britain. But let me see. I, I don't know if there's a new, any neutral historical things. Bob? Um, it says that Clement of Alexandria referred to Paul as early as the late first century. Right. We have internet here, so he just looked it up. Um, yeah, Clement of Alexandria, which was in Egypt, of course, late late first century, um, would still have been, he was part of the church. And as I say, I know there are church traditions, but in terms of kind of neutral historic observers like Josephus or like Suetonius, uh, I'm not aware of any, but it's possible. Certainly the early church fathers knew of him. I mean, he was a real historical figure, and the Clement of Alexandria and others would have talked about him a lot. But um, we well, have to see beyond that. My, my point being is, uh, you know, um, so many people that um, are not non-believers that, you know, that um, look at the Bible as something as uh, just like a um, just a religious book and not as a historical historical book. Right. And um, I don't think um, there's a lot of people that. Um, I guess it's not advertised. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Very much as it is part of a part of the history. Right. It's not emphasized, or um, you know that th this truth is you know is, right. is witnessed by other people, and it's not just. Yeah. Now there wasn't a lot, and there, there's a reason right. for that, though. Um, even in the case of, of Jesus, because we think of Christianity as being. It's the dominant religion in the world. There are more people who claim to be Christian, whether they really are or not, than any other religion. Well, that wasn't true. 
until the fourth century. The fourth century is the first time that it even was legal. And it's, you know, in Constantine, in the nice the Council of Nicaea, Constantine was the first emperor who even acknowledged that, that you could be a Christian and not be liable to be executed. Um, and so there were so few, and it was so small, historians of the day didn't have any particular reason to mention it. I mean, it would be, it would be uh, just a small, I mean, pick a small church someplace and say, compared to, to the larger scene of what's going on, would you talk about that? So... Um, not a lot of attention, but there are historical reasons for that. The fact that there are mentions at all are quite significant, I think. Yes, Ron. Uh, I have a question, if you could help. I miss on the notes a huge emphasis uh, at that time uh, when James was leader of the Jerusalem Council. You right. said prayer, but I missed some of the other ones. Do you have them at hand? Okay, that's not related to the, the Jerusalem Council. That's related to just the... the uh, one of the some yeah. of the major emphases that yes. that we have. Well, the universality of yes. the Christian faith, both Jewish and you know, it's for everybody. That was a major one. Strong emphasis on the Holy Spirit. As I say, some people have said this should probably be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit because it was the empowering of the Spirit that made all this happen. Um, a strong emphasis on the oppressed and the persecuted. A major emphasis on women. You know, there, there's the both in the Gospel of Luke and again in the book of Acts. Uh, and prayer. Prayer as being a major theme. The book of Luke, also uh, joy is a major emphasis. The reaction of people to Jesus as being one of joy. Um, this, there was a lot, of, a lot more struggle. I mean, there was joy too in terms of the fellowship of the believers, but there was a lot of struggle as well in the book of Acts. Um, I, I think it's, you know, what you were saying, uh, Becky, is to realize that this is a history. And it's fascinating stuff. It really is. Some of you all were in the, you know, the nine-year-long study of Acts that we did in our <laughs> <laughs> so, um, And is it, isn't it exciting stuff? Don't you think? Mm -hmm. It's fascinating history. It really is. Um, to, you get the personalities of Paul, for instance, and, and of Peter and of others. Paul, this guy who get right in your face, you know, right there. Um, time to time, but then apparently was really a likable guy because we have cases like the, the Roman centurion who was responsible for him when he was being taken back to Rome refused to kill him for instance when he was shipwrecked and uh, you weren't allowed to let prisoners escape you had to kill them if they were in danger of escaping and the soldiers underneath the centurion said looks like we're going to crash here should we kill the prisoners and he went no because he liked Paul so Paul had a way of, even though he was real abrupt about some stuff and could even get you know, hot about things, was very strong personality. I mean, he was a type A, let's face it. Still, he, he engendered uh, affection from people and, and a compassionate response to people, um, from people. And so, yeah, it's a fascinating character study through not just Paul, but all the others as well. You know, there's some interesting characters in there. And it is history. And we have to remember that. And interesting history at that. Okay. I want to go through very quickly and just give you, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these things, but I want you to see this because this is, is going to be available later today on the website. Sorry it hasn't been yet. It's been kind of a busy week. Um, the, uh, the book of Acts starts with, as I said, the witness in Jerusalem with the, the initial um, giving of the Holy Spirit. The power of the church is established. And we have the initial uh, going up to Pentecost and Peter's sermon. We then have the progress of the church growing with the healing of Peter and John, healings done by Peter and John. The Sanhedrin opposing, the Sanhedrin being the chief council of the Jewish faith, opposing Peter and telling him not to preach, which leads to another massive sermon. A lot more people become saved. Um, and the a number of events like Ananias and Sapphira who try to, who are, claim to be believers and try to lie about money and end up stricken dead by the Holy Spirit. So don't lie about money. Um, persecution begins. Stephen is martyred in the 6th and 7th chapter, the wonderful sermon of Stephen, who goes all the way back to the history, early history of the Old Testament, in order to lay the foundation of the truth of Jesus Christ as the fulfillment of the Jewish expectation. You get Saul persecuting the church, 
You get the witness of Philip in the 8th chapter, uh, who is one of the evangelists. He was one of the first. Uh, Stephen and Philip are two of the deacons that were assigned, literally, to wait tables, it said. Um, that they were, there were a lot of people in need. And the apostles said, we have too much to do to try to preach and teach. We don't have time to wait tables, too. So deacons were appointed. All of the deacons, interestingly enough, had Greek names. Because one of the problems was that the Hebrew widows and orphans were, I'm sorry, the Greek widows and orphans were saying that the church is only really taking care of the, of the Hebrew widows and orphans. And this was that conflict between the Hellenized Jews who spoke Greek and the Hebrew Jews who didn't think Greek was good. And that was one sign of the conflict. And so they named deacons, all of whom had Greek names, so that they would take care of the Greek widows and orphans as well. One of them was... Uh, Philip, one of them was Stephen. Those are the only two of those deacons that we really know very much about after that. The conversion of Saul, how he's, he is uh, converted and blinded, filled with the Spirit, and begins to preach. And then the witness of Peter comes in for a little while, and then the witness of the early church at Antioch. We do have a testimony about the persecution of Herod in the 12th chapter. And then we go to the missionary journeys, where the ends of the earth start. And again, if you look at the, catch, the witness in Jerusalem, and then the witness in Judea and Samaria, and then witness to the ends of the earth, beginning with the missionary journeys of Paul and to Barnabas. And it's interesting, as I said, that it started out talking about Barnabas and Paul. And during that first missionary journey, fairly early on, it started being Paul and Barnabas. Because... The Holy Spirit anointed Paul in such a powerful way to, to preach and teach and evangelize and that he ended up becoming the prom more prominent even though Barnabas had been earlier. And again, Barnabas does not indicate any problem with that. The only problem he and Paul had is that Paul didn't want to take Barnabas' cousin John Mark with him on the second trip, and Barnabas did. So we have ministry at a number of different churches, uh, first on the island of Cyprus, then Antioch, Iconium, Lystra. Um, then the Jerusalem Council happens in there in, uh, after the first missionary journey in the 15th chapter. Then you get the second missionary journey, which goes overland. You'll see contention over John Mark there in chapter 15. Then Paul goes overland to Derby and Lystra again, and then to Troas, which is on the coast of Asia Minor, and he gets a vision of a man in Macedonia calling them to come over and help in Europe. So they cross over by boat. Philippi is one of the first churches planted, uh, is the first church planted in uh, Asia, in, I'm sorry, in Europe. Then Thessalonica and Berea, he goes down the coast to Athens and preaches in Athens and then across to, um, uh, what's it called? Peloponnese, the, to, um, to Corinth, and then comes back and returns to Antioch. Then the third missionary journey, where he travels to Galatia and Phrygia, then Ephesus, where he spends three years, the longest time Paul spent in any one place, <coughs> then crosses over to Greece again, Macedonia, to Troas, um, and then back to, he comes back, he's in a hurry to get back to Jerusalem before the Passover, he lands in Tyre, um, he, um, he is arrested, in, or he's beaten up in Jerusalem, and then arrested to protect him, he ends up getting taken to Caesarea. Uh, there is a prediction that by Agabus, a Christian prophet, that he is going to be persecuted. After his witness in Jerusalem, he's taken to Caesarea. From Caesarea, he's taken to Rome. And Acts ends in the 28th chapter with Paul in jail in Rome. And that trip, you know, you, you'll notice the trip to Rome is from the 21st to the 28th chapter. whole lot of stuff goes on in there. You know, very exciting, very scary stuff. It's great to read about. I'm glad I wasn't there. Uh, because it was a pretty rough trip. Uh, and Paul told him it was going to be bad. He said, you guys, you, you, you need to sit, sit out the winter. And they decided to try to get to Rome anyway, and they ended up being shipwrecked. Okay. Mm -hmm. Questions about the book of Acts, or for that matter, the book of John. I could have done Luke and Acts together, but I think it was important that we did the Synoptic Gospels separate from John, because they are so different, rather than... Uh, it's interesting that there are a couple of ancient... Um, New Testament collections that put the Gospels in a different order. There are, there's at least one that puts John first because it was the most theological and John was so respected. There's, there are some that do uh, Matthew, Mark, John, Luke, Acts because of the fact that Luke wrote both Luke and Acts. But we have gathered them 
Matthew is the first one because it is the most Jewish, and so it's seen as the appropriate bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Mark is next because it's seen as the, as the testimony of uh, Peter through John Mark. Um, Luke, third, as the Gentile, the one who wasn't actually there firsthand, or you know that he, his, he collected his from different places. And then John, because it stands apart as being unique amongst all the Gospels. Questions or comments about any of that? Mary? Um, just a comment that there's so much detail in Acts that makes it so real, like like Eutychus falling out of the third story window. Exactly. How would you, you can't make stuff up like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Eutychus, it's, and the great part is, and one of, the, one of the signs of truth, you're exactly right, Mary, one of the signs, the marks that this stuff is true is that they don't go to great pains to make the heroes look good. There are places in which the heroes, particularly in the Gospels, you know, the, the disciples and the apostles, look kind of dorky. Uh, and again, if, this was, if they were trying to sell a bill of goods, you wouldn't be doing that. When Peter is, is kind of dumb and he doesn't know what to say, and so he just mouths off some nonsense, and, you know, and Luke in capturing it said, Peter didn't know what to say. <laughs> sort of trying to excuse it, like, well, he's doing the best he can, but he's kind of a dork uh, at that point in time. Um, the same thing is stories like Paul comes back and he's preaching, and he's preaching, and he's preaching, and he's preaching all night long. And everybody's gathered around the front of this house listening to him preach, and this young man, you is sitting in the third story window, and Paul puts him to sleep. And he falls asleep and falls out and dies. And Paul has to raise him from the dead. Well, saying that the Apostle Paul was preaching and this guy fell asleep because it was so long and so dry or whatever, you wouldn't tell that kind of story if you were trying to sell a bill of goods. You wouldn't make Peter look dumb sometimes. You wouldn't have James and John trying to get preeminence over the other disciples and their mother coming along to try to make it happen. Okay? Uh, why would you do that if you were trying to make up stories in order to get somebody to buy your version of it. It has the ring of truth, very simply. And it's fascinating stuff, all of this detail. When you get into the five or six chapters of Paul's travel to Rome, they tell you how they set the sails. They tell you what direction the wind was blowing. And you know, you can practically hear the creaking of the timbers, you know, on board this boat as you're reading this stuff. It's it's really fascinating and very detailed. It is history and it's interesting. Um, and it is also God's word to us. So, we've got a lot going for it. Here, I, I also read about, you know, where, where, where Paul was writing about uh, women in the church and, and, you know, they were having these struggles about what women should do and, and blah, blah, blah. Um, that it wasn't just with them, it was all the regions and all levels of society for having the same, were, were, they were at that time having like, same questions. Like, I don't think that was the only time in history they had trouble with women, but... I I read that like in Greece and, and yeah. uh, like what they were considered the most educated societies, they were also, um, it was a, like a hot topic and, and a hot thing. They were, some regions treated women better than other mm -hmm. regions. Some cultures and, too. Yeah. yeah, and so they were all struggling, not just the church. It was sort right. of, it was just, you know, everywhere. Right. I've talked about this before, but mm -hmm. earlier I said that Paul was a great liberator of women. And most people think that Paul was this great oppressor of women because he said in places, uh, I don't want women teaching men. He said, I want women to be calm in the church. The translation that you sometimes read, I want women to be silent in the church, is a bad translation. Calm is better. How can that be the same person who wrote, there's no longer Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, ultimate equality? Who could say, women have the highest of all spiritual gifts? Who could say, women are co-laborers in my faith? Not subordinates, not, you know, the, they're doing the kitchen work. They were co-laborers, equals. Because in that day, a lot of the people who were becoming Christians, in fact, they weren't Jewish, all of them who, who were becoming Christians, had been part of the pagan cults. That was the religion of the day. If you were Greek, if you weren't Jewish, then you had something to do with worshiping the pagan gods. Most of the pagan cults of that day, like the cult of Artemis, which was the most powerful, that was the temple of Artemis in Ephesus, was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Those 
uh, pagan cults primarily had women priestesses or virgins, you know, uh, that, that is temple prostitutes, but they weren't, you know, they were powerful. You know, they, they were women of significance. Because they had been used to running the religion of the pagan cults, when they became Christians, the suggestion is pretty clear, is that there were at least two instances, Corinth uh, and Ephesus, I think it was Corinth and Ephesus, that the women um, were trying to take over. They were being pushy, they were trying to run the services, they were telling people what to do, because they had been used to being in charge of the religion, and they thought they were going to come over and do that same thing in the church, and it wasn't working. It was causing problems. So Paul, when he's speaking generally, like there's no longer Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, he speaks of equality amongst men and women. When he's dealing with specific circumstances, a specific church, where there was a problem with women being, you know, being the problem, then he says, I don't want you women teaching, I don't want you being uh, disruptive, I want you to stay calm when you're in the church. And you guys settle down, women, you guys, you women settle down. That to me is the only way it makes sense that the St. Paul could write those different things. It's the universal statements versus the specific statements. And when we talk about developing our own theology of leadership, we take the universal statements. That's why we, as a church, we have women elders, we believe in the ordination of women, we do not believe that Paul intended for there to be a generality drawn about women not being in leadership. Okay? We believe this is based in Scripture. Last questions or comments? Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Have a great week, and I'll see many of you back on Thank you.